So thank you for joining in for uh, today's Ravenna uh, webinar. Uh, it's the first of uh, two practical webinars about setting up AES67 systems. Today, the, we will concentrate and focus on how to configure devices uh, to play in a nice AES67 setup and how to set up streams for transmission and um, reception. Uh, just a quick uh, remark on my side. My name is Andreas Hildebrand, working for ALC Networks, the Ravenna guys. Ravenna has been in, uh, uh, introduced to the public 10 years ago. And uh, my guest today uh, will be Claudio becker Force, who is um, also going to present uh, most parts of the um, presentation today. He's a CEO and CTO from DirectOut, a company founded in 2008 in Midweida in the middle of Germany. And uh, Direct Out is one of the very, very early Ravenna partners since 2009. So even one year before Ravenna had been introduced to the public, Direct Out was one of the uh, uh, early adopters of Ravenna technology. So a quick overview on what will happen today. First of all, this will be a 90-minute uh, uh, presentation or webinar. Uh, Claudio will first talk about uh, the necessary PTP configuration in the devices. This will take um, a moment, um, so we will offer a quick bio break, since this is a 90-minute session today, a quick bio break in between. Um, then uh, he will uh, turn to stream configuration um, and uh, will also demonstrate differences in setting up streams in Ravenna mode, in AES67 or SMT SD2110 mode, and how to exchange uh, streams with uh, Dante in AES67 mode. All this will uh, not just be a uh, theoretical presentation, but Claudio has prepared a demo system where you can actually see him uh, guiding you through uh, the steps uh, which are involved to set up uh, devices. Finally, time permitting, we will have uh, also some tools uh, which we'd like to introduce. And um, unlike all the other webinars, we will have some smaller Q&A breaks in between. So again, I encourage you to use the uh, Q&A function to post any questions you might have concerning a particular topic, and uh, we will be happy to answer them uh, in the smaller Q&A breaks or at the uh, larger Q&A um, at the end. So without uh, further ado, I'll jump into the topic and I would like to hand it over to Claudio um, Beckerfoss from Direct Out. Claudio, you should be uh, in control right now. Hello, welcome. And you can take it from there. Hello. Thank you, Andreas, for the introduction and um, also, of course, for uh, the invitation to present here today. And thank you all for joining. Um, yeah, let's let's start directly. Um, I, um, as Andreas already um, showed you quickly, what what we have on the table for today. I will start with um, yeah a brief. Um, a brief introduction of uh, the PTP concept. Don't be scared for those who, who already um, saw the presentation last week of um, Daniel and Andreas together. Um, it will not go too much into details of the theory and, and the aspects behind. Um, if you haven't seen that, uh, I think it's it's uh, somewhere on the web as a video, so you can, you can uh, have a look at that afterwards. Um, but I think it's very crucial to um, yeah, when you start setting up um, an audio of IP and a digital um, audio system, it's uh, crucial to um, to have the synchronization right and uh, to take a look at that. So um, for now, um, just a quick overview over the setup I prepared for today. We have a Montone 42, um, which acts also as a grandmaster here, which is a Ravenna Madi bridge. And then I have as a, as a central switch an Artel 1G Crora, um, which is a PTP aware switch, but can operate in different PTP modes, which we will see later. Uh, I have 
three um, I.O. boxes here, a Prodigy MC with a Dante I.O. card, which works in AA67 mode, a Prodigy MP with a Ravenna I.O. card, and Emerging Horus, which is also a Ravenna um, I.O. box uh, from Merging, and then two Genelec speakers with Ravenna IP connection, so we can play with those devices. Uh, during the pre presentation, I will switch over every now and then when it makes sense to this view, which uh, shows the web interfaces, configuration interfaces of the devices involved. This is the Montone 42. Uh, then we have the RAV IO, which looks quite similar. And we have the Horos Advanced page. And finally, the configuration page of the Genelec speakers, which is um, done by Artwave modules in this case. And of course, we will uh, just briefly um, touch the switch configuration surface. So just that you know where we, where we uh, are if I switch from the presentation to the actual devices. Yeah, so let's start with um, uh, just a quick uh, step into the concept behind PTP. Um, when you set up a digital uh, system, normally you um, well you you have always have to have the devices in sync. They need to be synchronized, and uh, you did that with uh, Word Clock, uh, Madi, AES, uh, where the um, actual timing is transmitted over um, a certain link. For instance, the Word Clock connection. So the actual sample frequency is transmitted over a connection between the devices. In networks, uh, this is a bit different. The PTP concept um, uh, shares uh, information about the time, uh, not the timing, but the time that is shared over the network. So the Grandmaster sends out sync messages, which um, contain the information, what time is it right now? And all the nodes in the network receive that information and derive from that a media clock. So their sample clock is then derived from the information, what time is it right now and um, how long is one second, for instance. The crucial point is that this time distribution is uh, so accurate over the network to any device in the network that participates that the resulting media clocks are AES 11 compliant again. So they are really phase accurate. If we transfer this to the setup we have here today, um, you see the Grandmaster sends the PTP sync messages to all the devices. And it's immediately clear if I send uh, two streams, left and right channel, for instance, to the two speakers, um, they need to be sync um, uh, in, in sync and phase accurate because otherwise uh, you don't get a proper stereo image. So this is really a crucial point that needs to be achieved by the PTP synchronization. And um, we will see uh, how, we can, how we can achieve that and that it's, it's possible. Also, the devices talk back to the Grandmaster um, and uh, measure the delay that is introduced by the network with delay requests and the Grandmaster answers with delay responses. So this is the communication going back and forth between the devices and the Grandmaster device. Now, um, if we look closer at the PTP configuration, um, we have several um, situations that might be in place. I reduced the setup now to just one device as an example because it's easier to to see what's going on, but this applies actually to all devices involved in this setup. We will start with a non-PTP aware switch, which might be um, in place in, in many applications and um, which is uh, okay to use um, if you stay in the network um, with network devices and it's properly configured, a managed switch, um, that, is, that is fine. Um, so, uh, what happens is the Grandmaster sends the sync messages through the switch to the device. And the time information goes through the switch. And the switch needs some time to process that packet, the sync packet. Um, it determines where it needs to go to and then sends it out to the proper port so that it arrives at the device. But 
this takes some time and as a result there is an offset introduced to that time information when it reaches the node that means um, it's uh, close to the grandmaster but um, not really um, accurately uh, the same time information that is uh, reproduced at the at the device and there's another issue that is that the processing time of the switch is not always the same uh, it might happen if the switch doesn't know about ptp it doesn't it doesn't care it's it's just a packet that comes in and goes out at some time and um if if uh, if something else happens if some there's a lot of other traffic in the network and the switch is busy doing other stuff um the the packet might might take a bit longer so it it's a bit more delayed or sometimes it's a bit faster because nothing is else to do so um this this might um this this offset that is introduced might um vary a bit and this this um, results in some jitter on the receiving device. Uh, you can shape that a bit and um, uh, help to reduce that by, by using uh, quality of service and making sure that PTP goes in, uh, through the fastest queue, so it's, it's uh, prioritized over the other traffic. But still, um, there's some, some uh, jitter in, uh, involved and introduced. And if we look at the devices now, um, Let's switch over here, go to our Ravenna I.O., which is currently the slave. We can see down here there's a jitter graph, which looks um, a bit messy right now. And the reason is that I have no um, PTP uh, functions activated at the uh, Crova switch right now. So if, if we take a look here, there's no PTP clock configured right now, and um, it's just a plain. Um, PTP non-aware switch. So the resulting PTP is okay. This is something, um, these are values where, where um, the device can, can stream properly and receive streams properly. Um, but the issue is if um, this jitter increases because there's more load on the network and you want to synchronize other devices that are maybe not part of the network, but they are MADI or AES connections that need to synchronize to two different uh, network devices, uh, then you might um, become an issue because they might not be able to cope with that jitter an anymore. And um, then that's not a good thing uh, because that creates problems when receiving um, the, the audio data. So what we, can we do about it? Um, there is the PTP E2E transparent mode, which can be used. It works in that way that um, still the device talks with the grandmaster and the grandmaster sends out the, the PTP sync packets and the time information. And of course, the switch still needs some time to process that. But if it supports E2E transparent clock, the switch knows how much time it needs. And on the outgoing sync packet, it compensates for that processing time. So there's a correction field that is sent along with the sync packet. And when the um, device receives that sync packet, it can recalculate the actual original time stamp. And therefore, it's much closer to the grandmaster that uh, to the sync packet that was originally sent out by the grandmaster. And this results in a much higher quality of the PTP. So if we do this right now, um, I just prepared a, um, config file for the Quora, which contains the E2E transparent clock. So now it's in here. And if we go back to our jitter graph, we see there's a little jump because the PTP configuration changed. But then um, we see immediately that the frequency of the jitter is much lower, so it slows down. And on the on the right side here, down here, you can see it that it smoothens out, and after a while, it will settle and be a very flat line. So it's a much better quality of the PTP 
transmission here and uh, the resulting the resulting clock. What we can see here now is also um, the Grandmaster ID, so I can make sure that I'm really synchronized to the right device. Uh, as you can see here, it ends with 2004E, and this is the actually the the end of the MAC address of my Montone, and I can see here the Grandmaster ID. So this is actually the right Grandmaster. The rough I/O is connected to the Montone and gets the um, sync from there. And I can also see the IP address is the 210, which is the one of the Montone. So I can double check that I'm really synchronized to the right place. And um, thanks to the E2E transparent clock, you can see down here in the jitter graph that it's really helping to smooth um, uh, smooth out the, the PTP jitter. And um, this stays like this even if uh, the network load uh, increases because the compensation is always done. Even if the PTP packets get delayed a bit longer, uh, the compensation is still there, so it's much easier for the receiving device to cope with that and to recalculate the actual uh, time information. There's another um, option we could use, which is the boundary clock, and that works a bit different. Um, the Grandmaster sends out the sync packages to the switch, and then the switch um, uses the sync packet uh, packets to synchronize itself to the grandmaster. So it does not pass them on; they are they are discarded and they are used to synchronize in the switch. And the switch generates a new clock that is then sent to the um, nodes in the network. By that, uh, the devices in the network only talk to the boundary clock, and they do not reach the grandmaster anymore. So the um, the actual uh, load um, if in, in a small setup like like the one we have here, it's not a big deal if, if there's a, a three or four or five devices talking directly to the grandmaster. That doesn't doesn't really matter. But if um, I have a big network like with hundreds um, or several hundreds of devices, uh, they cannot be all be handled by a single grandmaster. Um, that's too much. So. Um, with using by using uh, boundary clocks, uh, this burden can be uh, moved to the switch level, and the grandmaster talks to a couple of switches, and the switches then talk to all the devices that are connected to that particular switch. And by that, um, it's it's a good way to to spread the load that is required to inform all the devices about the the actual delays, uh, handle the delay requests and responses. And um, also the uh, connection between the device and uh, its its direct grandmaster or the boundary clock is very um, immediate and and uh, it's um, it's symmetrical. So uh, that really improves also the uh, resulting PTP clock quality. And of course we can take a look how this would uh, turn out here in our setup if I change my setup now in the switch and use the boundary clock like this. Yeah, now we have the boundary clock here. And if we look at the jitter graph, um, it was just reset due to the clock change and now it settles again. And what we see now is that the Grandmaster ID has changed. Uh, it's not the one of the Montone anymore. And the reason is that currently the switch acts as the Grandmaster towards my device because the switch itself um, also needs some time to synchronize to the Grandmaster. As you can see here now, um, here the Grandmaster ID is correct. It's 20004E. So this is as you can see up here, that is the right grandmaster. Uh, it's my Montone, but the state is phase locking. So it's currently not in sync yet. And therefore, um, I see here that uh, my, my switch is currently my grandmaster ID and also see 
a different IP address, which is the IP address of the switch, the 180. And after a while, um, the switch will go into locked state, and then I will also see the right Grandmaster ID. So if I refresh here now, now we see this is in locked state, and we see here, yeah, the Grandmaster ID switched to the Montone back. So I can see now I'm really synchronized to the right Grandmaster as I intended in my setup here. And I still see the IP address of the switch, which is uh, quite helpful because now I know I'm actually connected to a boundary clock. So my, the, um, the IP coming here from the switch is um, the 180. And the Grandmaster ID if, is the one of the Montone. So now it jumped jumped out for a moment, but uh, as soon as it's settled, it will stay with the Montone, and then um, I can make sure that I'm connected to the right clock here. Okay. Um, so far for the um, for the PTP configuration, I think it's really crucial that um, the Synchronization in the network is set up properly because um, otherwise, um, yeah, the, the, I, I don't see a point in start streaming. We, we had uh, um, customers that uh, started with setting up streams uh, as the first thing they did, and then uh, um, all kinds of issues arise because uh, nothing was in sync. And uh, I think it makes sense to really have the clocking straight before you start setting up everything else. Um, yeah, so that's a quick uh, thing about PTP. Are there already some questions? Um, I don't see any uh, coming up uh, on the Q&A. Maybe I'll wait a few more seconds. Um, I just can um, uh, underline what you just said. Uh, same experience with our side here. We had uh, quite some uh, complaints about streams not being stable, not being set up, uh, which could not be set up at all. And it turned out that people just didn't uh, configure their PTP right. They don't even had uh, something like a grandmaster in place or uh, devices were running uh, without synchronization, freewheeling um, due to, um, you know, uh, not matching PTP configuration. So as a general uh, advice, make sure that your PTP setup is in place, that your devices settle on a grandmaster and they are all synced together. Otherwise, it's not worth to try any streaming at all. Yeah, and there's so well. There's, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, there's there's another thing. For instance, the some devices like like Dante, they they just mute if if they are not uh, synced properly. So um, uh, it, you cannot start working with that before it's it's settled. And also. Um, it makes sense to have the PTP uh, straight and stable before you load the network with stream data. All right, okay. meanwhile, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Claudio, okay. if you would yeah. like uh, to answer a few of them, I introduce Roland, uh, meanwhile. Roland uh, is uh, pulling uh, the plugs in the background, uh, keeping everything in place and tidy. So Roland, uh, what about uh, reading up some questions? Yes, we've got a couple of questions. So the first question is from, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, uh, Pierre, or, um, is boundary clocking the same as P2P, uh, P2P clocking? Mm, no, not really. Um, boundary clock means in this case that the switch is um, uh, really acting uh, as, as a slave towards the grandmaster. So it's synchronizing itself to the grandmaster and mm -hmm. acting as a grandmaster to the nodes that are connected to the uh, uh, to the switch. Uh, so this is the mechanism um, how, how that works. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, is a, the peer-to-peer -peer mechanism um, just refers to the way how the delays are measured between the node and the grandmaster. So uh, in E2E, uh, the measurement is done from the node up to the grandmaster for the whole chain, and in peer-to-peer, -peer, it's just to the next connection, and uh, it's just different segments of the network that are measured by by this mechanism. Yeah, in general, you can say that peer-to-peer -peer usually results in more precision, but uh, unfortunately, peer-to-peer -peer is very rarely supported by devices. All of them have to support E2E, but just some of them support peer-to-peer. 
Okay, we've got a question from Benny here who says um, the jitter um, you had at the beginning without um, E2E activated, would that be okay for a small installation of just a few devices? Um, yes, uh, and it, it always depends on what you do with your setup, what, what else is, is in place. If you stay inside the network, if you only have network devices, they um, uh, most probably will all be capable of um, handling a bit of jitter there because they have to buffer the streams anyway. So you have some, some uh, stream buffering in place and um, it, it will be fine to, to cope with that. Um, if you generate a media clock from um, a jittery PTP that then is supposed to synchronize, for instance, a MADI device, and this MADI device uh, connects to another digital device, which maybe is synchronized via word clock from from the grandmaster or something. In that case, it might be it might happen that that it doesn't match anymore. It, it cannot cannot uh, follow anymore. And in that case, it's really crucial that the PTP quality matches uh, what you expect from a word clock connection too. I okay. I mean, indeed. Following on from that, uh, Romain actually wanted to know what the configuration was. Um, before you um, uh, 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 before you um, switch to you know um, E two E transparent, so uh, it, what it was the configuration when you had the bad jitter? Nothing. It was it was just uh, blank. The the switch was not PTP aware in that case. Like like any um, managed switch you can you can buy that is that does not support PTP. Okay, and I think um, one more question. I think before we move on to the next section, um, Philippe asks. Um, I heard about one step and two steps uh, synchronization. Uh, what is the best? And is the setup depending on the grandmaster or from the slaves? Um, I will cover that in the next section. So uh, that's a really good transition. <laughs> Thank you. All right. It. So, yeah, Claudia, go on. And it, okay. <laughs> um, because I now wanted to to uh, yeah show briefly um, how to configure the devices actually to to get the uh, PTP. Uh, set up right and um, I will start with the uh, Montone here which is my grandmaster so let's zoom in a bit so we can focus on the part that is of interest now um, I configured the unit to a uh, customized profile which just means that I um, can access any setting I want um, that is, is uh, of interest for configuring the PTP here and I will go through that quickly. So, um, and I think by that uh, we will also touch some of the the questions here. If we start with the uh, the clock class and the accuracy, those are values that cannot be configured because they are determined by the device. Um, I, either they are fixed or they they depend on uh, things the user uh, should not touch. Um, there are several clock classes predefined in the IEEE standard. Um, for instance, if a device um, is synchronized to a GPS, it has a higher clock class. If it's uh, synchronized to an external reference, it has a different clock class. If it runs on an internal clock and has no external reference and maybe also no, no um, absolute time information, um, it has a different clock class. So depending on, on those uh, things, and there are a couple of more uh, uh, things involved, the clock class is determined and um, is uh, sent out to the network nodes when uh, and it is used in the best master clock algorithm. The, the best master clock algorithm is used to determine who is going to be the grandmaster in my network. And it contains uh, information about the clock class, the clock quality, uh, but also some um, other settings here. And uh, the devices negotiate automatically um, who is going to be the grandmaster. But I can, of course, shape this decision decision a bit, and um, we will see immediately how. Uh, one crucial thing you have to set up on any device and make sure that the setting is right is the clock domain. There can be uh, many different clock domains in the same network, and all of them can have their own grandmaster, whereas in one clock domain, only one active grandmaster is allowed. And if I want devices to be synchronized to each other, they need to join the same clock domain. So they need to be in the same clock domain. Um, I set this to zero here for my for my network port one. Network port two is currently not in use, but could be the same clock domain um, in, in a redundant network or it could be something different. 
um, depends on the application. But the clock domain needs to be set on all devices to the right value, to the matching value of the grandmaster. Otherwise, um, they will just ignore the, the announcements of the grandmaster and, and not synchronize to that. And now we uh, come to the priority here. And um, the priority uh, can be used to, um, to make sure which device becomes the grandmaster in, in the network. The lower the value, the higher is the priority. And uh, default value mostly is something around 128. I've seen that on, on a couple of devices. Um, the Horus, for instance, has 127. Um, but uh, it's it's in that range normally. And uh, if you go with a number below, but with a priority above that, you can make sure that uh, this device becomes the grandmaster. And the priority overrules all the other um, settings like like clock class or accuracy. Uh, it's it's actually um, a very safe way to make sure this becomes the grandmaster. Unless I have two. Uh, grandmasters with the same priority, then the other um, aspects come into account in the doing the best master clock algorithm. Priority two is another priority level, which is a bit um, in the range below um, in the in the best master clock algorithm. But uh, I set it to the same value here um, just to make sure that in any case my Montone becomes the grandmaster, even if there are other configurations um, somewhere. On other devices in the network. The announce rate um, is used to, um, to define how often a grandmaster announces itself on the network and tells everybody, hi, I'm a grandmaster and I have this clock class and this priority and um, all these things. And it's used, then the announce packets are used to run the BMCA, the best master clock algorithm. Then we have the sync rate. Uh, that is the, the actual rate how often a grandmaster sends out the sync packets. It's currently set to 125 milliseconds, so eight times per second, which is um, also the um, default uh, or the required uh, setup for an ST2110 network. And um, I could uh, set this also to one second, which is the, the default profile of, of PTP or even, even uh, less. Um, but um, when SIMT defined ST2110, they thought about what would be a good reasonable value, not to, to um, have too much traffic and too much processing burden on the nodes, but on the other hand, um, a fairly quick resynchronization in case uh, a device power cycles or joins the network. And um, they came up with this suggestion to have eight syncs per second to make the resynchronization rather quick but at the same time not to be too, uh, um, too cumbersome and to uh, take too much processing time. Then we have uh, the delay request setting here, um, which uh, is basically for um, the slaves, how often they ask for, for a delay response and uh, how often they measure the delay to the grandmaster. Eight seconds is not that often, but um, it's okay because the the path between the node and the grandmaster doesn't change often. The, the cable length doesn't really change. Uh, the network infrastructure uh, normally doesn't change that often. So it's okay to, to do this um, measurement every now and then uh, to stay accurate enough. Then we have the announce receipt time out here, um, which uh, is also used at the slave to um, determine how long does the slave wait until um, it uh, goes back into the best master clock algorithm if, if no announcement was received from a grandmaster. If the grandmaster goes away for some reason, um, it waits uh, just uh, three announce periods. And if nothing happens, if no announces come in, it goes into the best master clock algorithm. Either it goes to um, to an uh, idle state and just listens what's happening if, if it's set to slave only and if it's, the device is allowed to become grandmaster by itself and there's no better one, then it will just become grandmaster by itself. Then we have the uh, one-step clock and um, this is currently set to no, so we are running a two-step clock, which means that the grandmaster sends out um, a sync packet and immediately afterwards a follow-up packet which contains uh, another correction uh, value 
um, of the of the time the grandmaster needed to send out the sync packet. So this increases the accuracy of the PTP even more. Um, as I learned last week, um, it's it's a bit of a historical reason that this was required because um, uh, today's hardware is um, basically capable um, to do the timestamping very close to to leaving uh, to, to the to the NIC when when the packet actually leaves the device. So there's not uh, such a big need for a two-step clock anymore, but it's still uh, implemented in many devices and in use and um, if a device doesn't support that, one could use a one-step clock, um, which will just then not send the follow-up. So for even more accuracy, a two-step clock is recommended. Then we have the slave-only setting, which um, we will set on the slave. Uh, I will show you that um, in a minute. And um, then we have the delay mechanism, E2E or P2P. So end-to-end -end or, or peer-to-peer, -peer. and um, yeah, as I just uh, said when when I answered the question, it's, it's uh, the mechanism uh, which part of the network is measured with which um, uh, is it measured from the node back to the grandmaster or just to the next uh, segment, so to say. And uh, if the delay mechanism is set to P2P, then the P2P the p delay request uh, value comes in uh, into play which uh, then is a different value um, how often the peer delay is measured instead of the the end to end delay to the grandmaster so far for for my grandmaster device and on the slave um there's actually not much to to set up um as i said I have to make sure that the clock domain is right and um, matches the grandmaster. And um, I set the announce rate and the delay request. Uh, the sync rate is determined by the clock by the clock master, and it's also mentioned in the announce um, packets. Uh, but what is um, interesting here is that I set this to slave only, which means that even if the grandmaster goes away, uh, my Rough I.O. here will not attempt to become a grandmaster. And this is a requirement uh, by ST2110 uh, because uh, SMT wanted to avoid situations where uh, a production network, um, where the clock structure of the production network gets um, disrupted because a device comes in that attempts to be grandmaster and maybe for some reason some somebody uh, just out of fun set the priority to one and uh, um, uh, a high sync rate, and then this device joins and uh, takes over uh, the the uh, PTP domain. So um, this is something uh, you really want to avoid. It's it's good practice anyway to to configure the pre-configure the device in a separate network before you put it into the production network, of course. But uh, uh, simply still required the slave only flag to be set to true. Um, on any device as a factory default. So um, if you want to be ST2110 compliant, you have to have this flag on board and make sure that if a device comes just out of the box uh, and joins the network, it will never attempt to become grandmaster to make sure this doesn't break anything. Okay. Um, quick look at the other devices we have here. Um, of course, the Horus can also configure PTP and it can also be configured manually as you can see here. Um, you find similar values here, priority, um, you can see it's its own uh, grandmaster ID if it became uh, a grandmaster, the slave only flag, um, delay mechanism, announce rate, sync rate. And then down here in the status you see it's locked, the master status is false so it's currently a slave. And you also again see the grandmaster ID of the Montone. So um, this is matching what we have on the RAV IO and also a jitter measurement, which um, is displayed here. Um, yeah, to get an idea about the clock quality. And on my um, Genelec uh, speakers, there's not much to, to set. I can still, again, check my grandmaster ID, which matches the Montona again. The state is slave, so it's synchronized. That is good. And 
of course, I can set the clock domain. That is the most crucial thing. And um, anything else, um, I could, uh, th these these um, modules here could also work as a, as a grandmaster, but uh, maybe it's not um, their main purpose to run a speaker box as, as uh, the grandmaster in the network. So um, I guess that's fine to have not that much uh, to configure here for for the um, PTP. So for being a slave, this is absolutely sufficient and uh, the crucial information is there. We need to know whether we are synchronized, we are a slave and we know to we need to know to what grandmaster we are synchronized. And uh, this is correct here. So we are good to go and um, we are basically good to start streaming. Um, but before that, um, I ask quickly whether we have some more questions uh, that came in. Yeah, we have some more questions, Roland. Uh, yes, we do. So um, first of all, I'd like to just check um, if um, if Philippe can respond in the Q and A that if he's happy that his question got answered because Claudio was going to sort of move on. So if he can respond and just say yes or no if he has some other. Um, other things and in fact he asks um, um, he asks the packet time can be set to 125 microseconds or one millisecond what are the rules to choose one from the other um, that, that for streaming I guess right uh, that's coming in the next uh, yes maybe maybe we, we, we um, cover that in the in the next section I, I will go through the stream configuration anyway and then we can um, talk a bit about that Okay. Um, uh, Paul asks, um, does incorrect sync settings cause a buffer issue? Mm, it depends what what uh, the incorrect settings um, uh, what what the result of the incorrect settings is. If if the PTP really goes goes haywire, um, at some point uh, the timestamps will just not be right anymore. And if the timestamps jump off the, the the buffer size then uh, it, it depends on the implementation of the manufacturer what what happens um, as I said uh, Dante devices uh, tend to to mute then um, other devices still play back and um, uh, yeah th this is something um, that really depends on the application uh, in a professional setup I say you want to avoid that situation anyway I've got a question here from Olivier. Um, uh, uh, I think he said, which is best to use, um, one step or two step PTP mode on a Ravenna network? Yeah, I'll want to quickly jump in there because uh, I, I was a bit curious about what uh, Claudio uh, said there and maybe has just learned recently. Um, in general, one and two step uh, is a historic thing because um, uh, you want to have as precise timestamps as possible when a sync message leaves the grandmaster. And uh, in um, previous years, um, it was just not possible to imprint the exact precise timestamp when the packet hits the wire, just at the very moment the packet hits the wire. So what the people uh, implemented in PTP was, um, they sent out the sync message telling um, the system, okay, it's 12 o'clock and you know, what exactly seconds, whatever, let's uh, stick with 12 o'clock. And then they sent, um, then they recorded the exact time this message went on the wire, which apparently is a few, you know, nano, microseconds um, after 12 o'clock, but they wanted to transport that information, of course, and then they said, sent a second message, which is called the sync follow-up message, which then contained the precise timestamp of the first message hitting the network. So um, now modern hardware is uh, capable of imprinting the very precise exact time when the packet hits the network, onto this particular packet. So that's the one step operation, two step is not required uh, for those uh, impl um, implementations. What I, I disagree with you, Claudio, is that there is any uh, precision or accuracy issue with one or two step. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it should not make any difference if the grandmaster or the master clock uses one or two step, essentially. If it can't uh, imprint a precise timestamp in one step mode, it has to use two step mode anyway. If it offers one-step mode, 
it sure is able to put a very precise timestamp into the nanoseconds on yeah, okay. this uh, pack yeah. going out. So it's not a decision you actively make based on the uh, uh, required uh, precision you or the precision you want to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got a, a, another question from uh, Luca who says uh, PTP uh, unicast, multicast, hybrid. When and why? <laughs> Luca. <laughs> um, yeah, well, there are there are different um, PTP modes, and um, what we use here currently is uh, multicast PTP. So it's uh, sent as uh, multicast packets to to a multicast address and um, received from um, any node in the network. There are also other modes where, um, in the hybrid mode, the sync packages are sent as a multicast um, information to the network, but the um, delay measurement, the delay re request and response is um, handled in unicast directly with a grandmaster, which uh, helps to reduce the load on the other participants in the network, uh, the other nodes, because they don't see all the multicast delay requests that are going back and forth. So if you don't have a boundary clock in place, for instance, and you want to make sure that um, uh, not all devices see the delay requests, you might want to use um, hybrid mode. And finally, then there's um, unicast mode where actually all PTP is handled in unicast. Um, I would like because this can we can uh, talk about that a bit more. Um, I would uh, just um, refer to a webinar we will do next week, beginning of next week on Monday um, at Direct Out, uh, where we will talk about it a bit more, a bit more, and also why this is uh, of interest. For instance, when you use um, a67 over one and uh, such applications. All right, and also looking at time, it, uh, I think we should proceed. Yep, we do. Okay. We've got a few more questions we can maybe tackle later. Let's go on and directly jump into the stream standards and stream configuration. I want to just uh, briefly um, give a recap of the situation around the different stream formats we have. Um, Starting with Ravenna um, 10 years ago now, um, well, um, I will I'll do that uh, rather quickly because there's a lot of information around about that. Um, but uh, yeah, Ravenna is uh, based on um, RTP multicast streaming, as you know, uses PTP for synchronization and is um, kind of sample rate agnostic. So you can use basically any sample rate you want up to DSD. It depends, of course, on the implementation, um, but the um, specification of Ravenna itself does not um, restrict anything there or um, define anything there uh, other than how to do it, um, but but not restrict it in any way. Um, packet times are um, available uh, um, well as as um, as the implementation um, requires it. So you can even use it for for WAN applications. Um, with a long distance transmission with uh, um, huge packet times or go down to ultra low latency packet times, um, even down to one frame per packet, also depending on the um, implementation. And maybe um, just to to uh, tackle that quickly, the question that came up uh, regarding the packet times, um, it depends on the application, of course. If you want to have low latency, um, you um, should use rather small packet times. If you want to transmit many channels, you need small packet times, otherwise it will not fit in the MTU. Um, but uh, maybe if you have um, networks with um, long delays and uh, maybe a bit unpredictable um, transmission situations, like over a one, even uh, maybe even if it's if it's not a dedicated um, link uh, between cities, uh, uh, it could even even be a, an internet connection. Um, in that case, you need, of of course, um, uh, bigger packet times and um, yeah, um, also a lot of buffering on the receiving side. So it it depends on the application and um, uh, everything is is possible with with the Ravenna specification. And then uh, Ravenna has MDNS and RTSP. Um, uh, in use for stream discovery and connection management. So this is built in. And uh, if a Ravenna device uh, um, is, is uh, built, it, it will offer this um, option to use stream discovery and connection management over MD MDNS Bonjour. 
Um, when Ravenna was released, um, the industry embraced it, um, but uh, soon um, people came and said, we, we would like to have this rather in a um, official uh, independent standard form. And um, then AES uh, chimed in and um, AES came up with AES67. And um, Andreas was, uh, for instance, um, quite involved in the standardization of AES67 and um, uh, some some other guys from the industry. So basically, A67 uses a lot of uh, things that are in Ravenna available anyway. Um, it just adds unicast streaming, which was not available in Ravenna up to, to that time, and SIP as a protocol to negotiate the unicast connection. Um, but it uh, does not contain the MDNS discovery. So um, the A67 task group decided to not uh, define any means of stream uh, discovery or uh, device discovery or connection management because they wanted to focus on the pure audio transmission between the devices and um, leave the whole management out of scope of the standard. The sample rate, uh, which is mandatory, is uh, 48 kilohertz and a packet time of one millisecond, which does not mean that AS67 cannot do more. Um, we will see that later. But uh, this is something which is mandatory if a device claims to be AS67 compliant. It at least needs to support 48 kilohertz and a packet time of one millisecond. Then at some point, uh, SIMT started working on the uh, ST2110 standard. And they decided for ST2110-30, which is the audio part of that standard suite, to rely on AS67, to refer to AS67, and uh, just, um, of course, do some adjustments, because otherwise you cannot just take it, what's there. <laughs> uh, so uh, they came up with a different PTP profile, um, which defines, uh, for instance, the uh, 125 millisecond sync time. Um, sync interval of, of the Grandmaster. Then they added ST2022-7 uh, as a stream redundancy option. And they removed unicast and SIP again from, from the uh, mandatory part of ACC7, so to say. So if you do ST2110-30, you don't need to support unicast and SIP. And uh, they require the media clock offset to be zero, which is um, normally um, a random value, but uh, this causes an issue if a device power cycles. The new um, media clock offset needs to be uh, sent to all the receiving devices. They need to be updated and informed about the new offset. And uh, simply took a shortcut and said, no, if we set it to zero, there's no way to, uh, there's no need to update everybody about that. So we, um, we make it simpler and uh, faster to recover. Um, okay, so this is this is actually what what uh, ST2110 um, requires. So um, the implementation we have here, um, our Ravenna implementation covers all that. Um, as we started with Ravenna, um, we we updated our implementation um, with every step, with every um, standard that came up to to stay in sync with that. And um, yeah, let's take a look now at the actual um, configuration of the streams. So if we go here to my Montona, I can just set up a stream, um, call it Ravenna, for instance. Uh, say we want to do 24 channels. Um, so I set uh, the number of channels to 24. Uh, the default destination IP address, the multicast IP address uh, is fine. I can leave it at that and all the other values. The audio format is set to 24 bits, which is which is also fine. And um, the packet time uh, is set to 20 samples per frame, so 0 0.42 milliseconds. That is also okay for now. I switch it on. And I also see here as a convenience information the um, the RTSP links, which could be used on a receiving device to obtain the SDP file. Um, but as I said, uh, in Ravenna, the um, announcement also works with um, MDNS. So on my Prodigy Rav IO now, I can just select the discovery protocol Ravenna session here and 
select the Ravenna um, uh, session I just created and connect to that stream. And that's basically it. Then uh, the stream is uh, set up, the STP is passed and I am connected. So I get a green, green light here and now I'm streaming from the Montone and um, it works quite similar. For instance, on um, the Horus, I just create a new sync. Uh, the stream input is called sync here and select the Ravenna stream from the list of available streams. And then um, after the STP was passed, I can um, stream directly. For the speakers, it works also in a similar way. I just select the Ravenna stream here. And then, of course, I have to set the channel I want to use. For instance, if I set this to, say, tw channel 23, if I have a stereo mix, say, 23 is my left channel. And then I apply here. Now it's receiving and switch over to my other speaker, say it's the right speaker, and then channel 24 gets this speaker. So this is also, it's a bit hard to see here, but it says receiving. So um, my speakers are now receiving um, different channels of the same stream or playing, playing back. And uh, thanks to the um, PTP synchronization, all of that is in sync and face accurate, so I can really listen to a stereo image and um, I'm connected to, to my stream from the Montone. So far, so good. Uh, that was fairly easy. Um, if we now look at AES67, um, the mandatory part of, of AS67, as I said, requires 48 kilohertz, um, 16 and 20 bit, the 24 bit, um, up to eight channels per stream, multicast and unicast, packet time of one millisecond. So this is all um, basically known, known stuff. I guess um, most of you know that um, already. Uh, but there's a bit more of um, possibilities in AS67 which, uh, for instance, involve different uh, other sample rates. You can, of course, do 96 kilohertz or 44.1 if, if required. Um, sometimes we, we have customers that come and say, well, I cannot use AS67 because it has too much, uh, the packet time, the delay is too big, or um, I cannot use 96 kilohertz. That's actually not entirely true. You can do that, and AS67 well defines how to do that, and, and also in a compatible way. Um, it's just that the mandatory part of the standard does not um, require to support these um, extras. But um, of course, a device can implement that. And many of the Ravenna devices, if not all, uh, do that and um, support A67, also the, the extra um, uh, options that are defined in the standard. Of course, with lower packet times, you can use uh, more audio channels on a stream. Uh, you could use a different IGMP version, um, but what is not available um, on A67 is the discovery because it was not scope of the standard, as I as I said. So if we now want to set up a stream configuration for A67 or ST2110-30, um, we need different means to exchange the um, the stream information and. If I now switch off my stream here and turn it into a plain A67 stream, um, first thing is I go down to eight channels. So um, to make sure we are well in the mandatory spec of A67, and I set the packet time to one millisecond here, 48 samples. Um, the payload ID is okay with uh, 98. This is actually a dynamic value, which could also be 96, 97, 99. Um, some devices automatically um, uh, uh, pick a number there. And on the receiving side, you have to be sure and make sure that uh, you match that number. Otherwise, you cannot connect to the stream. But um, it's fine to just, to just uh, use that number here as a default. And also the... 
Um, the IP address, I don't, don't have to change that. I just have to make sure that uh, my stream parameters are currently matching AS67, which is the case now. And if I switch this on, um, I also see here that there's a SDP information. So I get the stream information as an SDP out, output. And I could also um, go to a certain link on the Montone, which is um, the IP address and then sdp.htm question mark uh, ID number equals one, which is uh, the first stream. And if I load that SDP, I can see here, this is my A67 stream and um, use that information, for instance, uh, to configure a receiving device, which would look like this on the receiver. Um, if I switch off my Ravenna stream here, and then go down to manual configuration, I can enter all the values that are, um, or all the required values that are also part of the STP file manually in, into, this, um, into this device. So um, I give it a name, that could be anything, A67 in this case. Um, then I set the channel count to eight channels. Otherwise, it will sound a bit strange. The RTP payload ID matches already um, the 98, which I configured on my sender. The audio format is also fine with 24-bit. Uh, the media offset is zero, so this was, was would also be um, ST2110 compliant already. And then down here, I have the IP address, which is, of course, crucial to match. And uh, the 69210.1 dot one is the one I see here also in my SDP file. Um, so, or here, you can see that. So this is the right address. And when I switch on my stream, uh, it connects. So this would be a way to uh, manually configure the device if um, no Ravenna or no, no um, other means are available to transmit the SDP between devices if it's a pure A67 implementation without any other things around that. On the Horus, for instance, it's also possible to, to use a manual way to um, connect to the streams. In this case, only the, um, SDP data is allowed. So I can, uh, for instance, just copy paste this here. And then apply and uh, device starts streaming. So um, in this case, if I have to change anything here, if I have to change, for instance, the, the IP address, um, uh, I have to change the STP file, the actual STP file, or get, get a new one and uh, paste it here. Um, so there are uh, pros and cons for uh, different approaches. Um, but uh, the crucial thing is that it's, it's possible to enter manually um, STP data here. And the same applies for my speaker. I can just copy paste the SDP here, say apply, and then um, just select the channel I want down here, I want to, um, to listen to on, on that particular speaker. So this is um, how I can connect manually to A67. Uh, if I want to turn this now into a ST2110-30 compliant stream, so call it SD2110-30. And uh, the only thing we have to do is to switch it on again because it's already SD2110 compliant. There's nothing to change here. It's, uh, uh, if it's a plain A67 stream, it will also work with SD2110-30, um, given that all the parameters I just touched are um, compatible. So that's um, uh, an easy task in this case. And then can be received by um, other devices that support A67 in, in, this, in this way. So now, you've seen that. Um, now for A67 with Dante, this is a, um, a different chapter or a separate chapter for um, the reason that the A67 implementation of Dante has um, a few peculiarities. Um, we have to 
take into account when planning and configuring the system. Um, first of all, well, the, the transmission um, allows up to eight channels. That is fine. It's uh, part of the mandatory uh, or in spec of the mandatory uh, part of A67. Um, on the reception side, receiving side, uh, up to 64 channels are um, allowed meanwhile. Um, there's multicast only, so no unicast support, which is strictly spoken not A67 compliant, but um, maybe in practice not such a big deal. Um, there is a restriction to the multicast IP range, and that is something you really have to consider and keep in mind when planning your system. There's a so-called prefix. Um, so the multicast range um, Dante allows to use is 239, and then a prefix, which is by default 69, but can be changed in Dante controller to um, a different value. However, um, all streams that uh, are supposed to connect to that A67 Dante device and, and go back and forth between it um, have to use that range. So 23969 and then something something um, can be used for um, connection to this particular um, Dante device in A67 mode. And if you have a big system um, where you might not be in the position to define by yourself what address to use, um, this might be an issue. So you have to uh, keep that in mind and uh, prepare the setup properly and, and uh, maybe make, make up your mind about the addressing scheme um, early enough to make sure uh, this doesn't, doesn't break at some point. Um, it's only 24-bit encoding uh, supported, no 16-bit, but uh, that's maybe not uh, such a big deal. Uh, the packet time is for the, again, for the transmission side, uh, just the mandatory part of AS67, one millisecond. So you cannot go below that, um, which means the very low latency streams are not possible, um, at least not in that direction. Uh, on the receiving side, uh, Dante supports also down to 125 microseconds for as a packet time. And then there's another thing. Um, uh, there are non-standard DSCP markings in use. Um, the A67 standard specifies uh, EF for the DSCP marking, the quality of service marking of PTP and AF41 for the media packets. Whereas uh, Dante uses uh, CS7 for PTP, that is fine, it's just a higher priority. But uh, for the media packets, they use EF. So um, in that case, if you put together a Dante A67 device and another A67 device that uses the standard uh, DSCP markings of A67, you might end up with media um, packets of a Dante device uh, in the same queue in the switch as PTP packets. And um, that is not really a good thing um, if, if the network is uh, loaded. So. You have to take care about that and maybe use uh, means in the switch to um, re remap the DSCP markings, uh, or um, it uh, should be possible now with Dante Domain Manager involved to change those settings in the latest firmware of, of uh, Dante devices. But with a plain Dante controller, um, you cannot address address that issue. The Dante redundancy mode is not available in A67. Um, uh, that is uh, fair enough. Um, just have to know about that. And also the Dante virtual sound card does not support A67. So now um, let's take a look at the actual configuration. I go back here to my A67 stream. Um, call it A67 again. And um, now I have to, to use Dante controller. So I um, let me switch to the main screen here so you can see everything. OK. So now you see here my Prodigy Dante I.O. And you can already see my A67 stream coming. I just generated on the Montona. So it shows up in Dante controller. And if I set a cross point here, um, my Prodigy Dante IO 
subscribes to the Montone A67 stream and starts streaming. So why is that? Um, there's no way to manually enter SDP data in Dante controller or in a Dante device, but um, Dante uh, choose to use the sub SAP protocol to transmit and um, um, share the SDP information about the streams on the network. And um, we implemented that as a native protocol and um, so so did merging and also the, the Archwave devices um, implemented the sub protocol and uh, by that it's possible to show up in Dante controller and um, share the SDP information with a Dante device in A67 mode. Now um, I also see here a Horus stream which um, has eight channels and um, shows up here in Dante controller so I might be able to connect to that too. Let's give it a try and it says no it doesn't work. Why is that? If you see that yellow label here, it says RTP subscription status is no audio. Um, that actually might not be true um, because uh, probably there is audio, but the actual reason behind this issue is a different one. If you look at the multicast IP address um, on the right side of that uh, yellow label here, it says 239.11.139. If I look at the one from the Montone, it says 23969. And uh, that is the reason why it doesn't work. Uh, the Horus doesn't stream in the right uh, multicast prefix. So if I change this here, uh, change the address to 69 and go back to down to controller. Let's see if we can connect now. Yes, it works. Okay, so um, this is one of the things uh, things you might uh, encounter when, when configuring the uh, Dante A67 devices and the error message is unfortunately not really helpful here, um, but uh, that was actually the reason that um, the prefix didn't match and that's why Dante controller refused to make that connection. Okay, um, for the transmission side, um, I can just double click on my device here and set up a multicast, create a multicast flow, which is uh, defined to be A67 compliant. And I can just create, a, for instance, an eight channel stream like this. And now I go back to my um, uh, rough IO, for instance. Uh, and change the discovery protocol to SAP, SAP, Dante, A67 session. And if I open the list here, I already see there's the Prodigy in the list shows up here. So I can obtain the SDP now from my Dante device and then connect to the stream. And it says uh, the stream ID is 32. So if I go back to Dante controller, yeah, the multicast flow here says stream ID 32 with the uh, address 182.109. And so I can can connect to that on, on my rough IO. And the same applies for um, the Horus. Um, so it's connected now here. And uh, on the Horus, I should be able to see the sub announcement as well, yes, it's here. So um, it's still fairly simple thanks to the sub protocol. It's just that it needs to be in place um, to make that work with, with Dante in, in both directions. Okay, um, what if I want to uh, create a bigger stream on my Dante device? Um, if I set up a new multicast flow with, uh, for instance, more than eight channels. Um, this is actually possible, although I said it just it only supports eight channels. And the reason is that if you look here, if I use more than eight channels, Dante creates automatically um, eight channel chunks of the streams. So this is now an eight channel stream plus two 
separate channels in a separate stream. And if I want to subscribe to all of them, if I want to have all the audio channels, I have to subscribe to all of these streams here to make sure I really get everything in my device. So this is the thing you have to keep in mind also that um, Dante just supports that uh, stream size. Okay. So let's go back here. And I think it's time for another round of questions if if uh, some are available before we go on to the tools. Yes. Um, thanks, Claudia, so far. Uh, Roland, I guess we have a few more questions. Yeah, we do indeed. In. Um, a, a first question comes from um, Adrian, and he asks, could you, uh, could you say that um, PTP aware switches are mandatory in environments where audio video sync is critical? My personal opinion is yes. I, I recommend PTP aware switches um, in, in any case because we made the experience that at some point, um, if you use uh, um, just managed switches, you can you can get good results. But at some point, um, you might uh, end up in a situation where the sync is not good enough anymore. Um, sometimes setups just evolve and and uh, new things come come into play. And uh, exchanging the switches at that point can be very hurtful. Uh, so. I, I recommend uh, if you plan a new system to go for PTP aware switches, and they are not that expensive anymore. Next week, by the way, um, uh, there will be a, a webinar uh, at the same time, same place here about switch configuration. So you might be able to learn a bit more about that. There. Yeah, let me just uh, chime in because there's another question from uh, Benny Reba. Uh, who asks if in a small installation environment where only network audio devices are connected, is it enough to just prioritize the P2P packets uh, by means of um, a QoS? And uh, I would still say, um, yes, uh, that should be uh, sufficient. I would say the, the distinction is if you definitely want to have face accuracy so that you match the requirements of AS11, um, mostly in cases where you have external devices synchronizing to your network streams, then it... Uh, you should strongly consider uh, using P2P switches in other environments where it's uh, only, uh, you know, a requirement to transport uh, data sample accurate with a line stream sample accurately. You should be uh, good with um, uh, proper QoS management in non-P2P aware switches. Okay, um, we have another question from uh, Nicholas. What are the advantages to using P2P for clock over other methods? Well, uh, in general, the network uh, for AS67 on a network, there is only PTP, uh, particularly version 2, uh, specified for synchronization. Um, we have uh, instances or applications where you have external clocks running around, like house clock or work clock or whatever. Um, they have to be in sync anyway. So either your work clock is generated from the same source, usually a GPS-driven uh, grandmaster clock or GPS-driven uh, clock source, or a network device which can um, output a word clock for synchronization of legacy uh, studio equipment. Um, so on the network side, you don't have any other chance than running PTP version 2 at all. If you all connect all devices to an external reference anyway and just transport streams across the network, you can do that. But, you know, what's the idea behind a networked audio transport then? Yeah, okay. Um, I think as um, time's marching on, we maybe should move on um, to the final yep. section. Yeah, just um, uh, go a quick overview of, um, over some tools. Um, I just like to mention because I think it's um, they are helpful when uh, configuring and debugging, uh, troubleshooting your network setup. So one thing, starting with PTP again, is the uh, PTP track count by Meinberg. Um, Meinberg manufactures Grandmasters, um, as you probably know, and they came up with a, a free uh, tool which is available for Mac and Windows and even Linux, I think, um, which is based on the Wireshark engine. So it captures packets, um, but then has a user interface that uh, is dedicated to PTP and gives you um, a human readable readout of, of what's going on on the network regarding PTP. Uh, shows you how the um, clock structure is, 
which device is the grandmaster, how many boundary clocks, how many nodes are con connected to which boundary clock, and uh, many more information. Um, and it can be, uh, you can see that uh, very quickly. You can leave it running in the background and uh, take a look every now and then, or um, even log what's going on. So it's a really helpful tool, and uh, it's available for free on uh, PTP Trackhound dot org i think um, but if you search for ptp track on the net uh, you will find it immediately you just have to sign up with your email address and get the download link um yeah i, re I really like to use that tool for ptp troubleshooting then of course there's wireshark um which is uh, the um uh yeah, uh, down to a bit level, so to say, uh, analysis tool, which uh, is very powerful, but um, also has a bit of a learning curve. Um, it supports a lot of stuff that is around um, audio over IP um, natively. So you can filter for PTP messages, um, for instance. Uh, you can um, filter for um, RTSP or RTP and, and uh, also take a look at STP files there. So that is a, a tool I recommend to be on installed on any computer that is involved in setting up uh, network audio or media network systems because it and if it, if it's just to find out what IP address has a certain device uh, or is it alive at all um, and of course uh, for troubleshooting if something goes wrong you can capture the network traffic and uh, send a file to the manufacturer who can then determine what's going on so. Um, also for for end customers, it's uh, or service departments, it's really helpful to have this at hand and um, make yourself acquainted with the usage, at least with the basic uh, stuff that is required to to create packets and maybe have a quick look uh, or first look at at the packets that are going on on your network. Then there's a um, fairly new offline tool which works on packet captures. So you, you capture a file with Wireshark, for instance, and then you can use the EBU list tool uh, to analyze that packet um, and determine whether it's uh, ST2110 compliant. So it's a tool that you can, um, uh, it's, it's an, there's an online version, um, uh, EBU list, uh, if, if you uh, Google for EBU list, there's an online version which works for smaller um, audio files, but for video captures, for instance, they are just too big to, to uh, uh, be uploaded to the server. Um, so you can go for a Docker image, which is available for free, and install that, run that locally, and um, then upload your stream, uh, your, your captures into uh, the list, and it, it can even um, well, it, it shows you whether it's in uh, the packets are in sync, the timestamps are right, the the um, stream formats are correct. You can even listen a bit to the audio or uh, look a snippet of the video data captured. So it's a quite helpful tool as well. And then there's um, SD Poker, uh, which um, analyzes. Uh, it's a command line tool which analyzes um, SDP files. And if you have issues with SDP files, uh, you could use it to uh, see where the issue might be. Um, actually, the uh, I had to create a wrong STP file to show you how an output could look like because if the STP is right, nothing happens. It's, you just go back to the command line. So if if you um, uh, SD poker and STP, um, don't be scared if you don't get any output because it's uh, on purpose and that is oh it should uh, it's supposed to be and it's it's all fine. So actually, um, this is it from my side, and uh, I can hand over back to Andreas to um, for more questions. Uh, we have a minute left, or um, yeah, so required. Um, yeah, we we are about uh, uh, about a time, but uh, you can stay for a few more minutes, uh, and we would like to answer a few more questions if you like. For those who want to leave, uh, we will have the slide deck as well as the recording available on the Raven webpage. And uh, yeah, further questions, uh, Roland. I've got uh, yeah, just a, just a couple more. You've done pretty well. Um, oops, um, you've done pretty well uh, um, with all the questions. Um, very long question from Peter, but um, if I can paraphrase this thing, he wants to ask how do you? Uh, normally, he's familiar with monitoring up to 128 streams of Ravenna, obviously quite a large. How could you um, monitor more than that? 
He wanted to monitor more than 128 streams. How might you monitor in terms of listen to them or? Um, um, I think, Andreas, if you read the question, would you say for listening? Yeah, I mean, this is a very particular question about a, a particular implementation. Um, and basically, uh, it's, a, it's a capability of a, a particular device, how many streams you can concurrently uh, listen or monitor to. In this case, it was an RTW meter um, with a Ravenna card inside. The particular Ravenna card had the capability to receive 128 uh, streams simultaneously, so it can monitor 128 streams without switching streams uh, at the same time. So if you want to um, monitor more than 128 channels, while the capability of the device is limited to 128 channels, you would have to just, uh, you know, uh, uh, subscribe to other streams on the network. There can be any number of streams on the network and uh, through the GUI of the particular um, device you should be able to instantly subscribe to other streams with another number of channels. It doesn't necessarily have to be a 128 channel set. Um, that depends how your streams are configured. So usually the GUI should give you the ability to subscribe to other streams. I'm not aware of this particular implementation, so I can't give you a particular answer to this a question by Peter, but in base, uh, in, in, uh, in principle, is a device has particular capabilities on how many channels it can receive concurrently. And uh, if you want to receive other channels, then you just have to subscribe to other streams. Okay, I've um, got a, a question from John who asks If I have a Dante device in AES 67 mode, will it sync to PV, uh, PTP version 2? It has to. Quick answer it has to. <laughs> it and does. it will do, yes. Um, yeah, shall we show it quickly or? Um, I no, know, I, I think it's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's the way it, it has, has to do. And it, it um, does. I think that's all good. And um, we've got, uh, I think this might be our last um, question. Um, is SIP intended, this is from um, Nicholas, is SIP intended to be used to negotiate connection, uh, uh, connecting remote with NAPs? Um, when would SIP be used over NDNS or um, RTSP for connecting to peers? Chloe, uh, in general, a quick answer is uh, when Ravenna has been, had been defined, there was no SIP in place. We used uh, MDNS RTSP for unicast and multicast connections. Um, SIP was introduced as a requirement for unicast connections by AES67, and we have uh, seen just very, very few implementations to actually support SIP. Uh, some of the more advanced Ravenna implementations have adopted SIP, so you can uh, actually use SIP to connect to um, uh, unicast uh, streams. Um, the original intention was that you actually can um, uh, yeah, handshake for a particular stream setup, but that has never been written into AS67 to a very explicit, uh, you know, um, a definition. So this is somewhat a weak point in AS67. It requires it, but it doesn't exactly tell you how and for what purposes. So um, that's certainly an area where we need to uh, work a bit more uh, within the AS67 spec. So by now, you can use SIP to transport the STP file for unicast connections. Uh, by the way, in some Ravenna uh, implementations as well for multicast um, implementations, but it's not to my, at least not to my knowledge, Claudio, you may correct me, it's not implemented anywhere uh, for actually, um, you know, handling or uh, talking about the desired stream format, negotiating the stream format. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, and um, actually two questions that are coming um, very similar, which I'm sure you can answer very quickly. Uh, Dante uh, AES67, yes, is it 48K only from Harold? And somebody else is asking, can it work with 96K? No, it's 48K uh, only. Yeah, that's the that's the compromise on uh, Ravenna. And I've got a final question, which actually concerns um, your products, um, Claudio. Your, uh, um, your products, you have an option to configure um, no PTP switch, um, one gigabit per second. Um, if we configure this to a value of, uh, say, two, uh, the Monton um, uh, PTP jitter graph uh, results in a sine wave. What does this mean? Um, it's uh, it's actually an adaptive uh, filter that um, uh, is used if, if the PTP jitter is, is fairly high because there's no PTP switch available. Um, it can be used to reduce the jitter and it um, makes the um, device follow the the um, incoming PTP packets uh, more slowly, so it takes longer to settle um, 
but at some point um, it will be able to cope with more jitter than um, than without that filter. So, for instance, if you transmit PTP over WAN, um, this this could be um, a good thing to to cope with that. Okay, um, and I've got um, one final question myself. Um, when is the next webinar, and or when are the next webinars, and what are they about? Yeah, of course. Um, first, let me uh, provide another two more links for more answers you might have uh, for your questions. The Ravenna website is always a good idea to turn to with everything with respect to not just Ravenna, but also AS67 and SMP SD2110. And of course, uh, uh, Direct Cloud has some valuable information available on their website as well. That's also uh, the, part of the time to thank Claudio for this wonderful presentation. Claudio, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and, and for yeah participation. Yeah. And actually, we will see you again next week. Next week, uh, Tuesday, same time, uh, we will uh, turn to the other part of our running system, how to configure the network, how do we configure switches. We will have uh, Bart Swinnen from Luminex, Niklas Stromel from Merging, Claudia becker and Barak, and myself talk about uh, how do we properly configure network switches in order to run uh, best or being best used uh, for Ravenna AS67 and 2110 uh, networks. Um, that's it for today. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining in, for staying with us so long, uh, even for the seven minutes overtime. Thank you, Claudia, again. Thank you, Roland, and hope to see uh, you all back next week, uh, 1500 Central European summertime. Stay safe and uh, take uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Ciao. Thank you.